So, welcome to lecture number 9 of module 1. In the previous lecture, we have introduced ourselves to soil compaction and then we discussed about the principle of compaction, factors affecting compaction and methods for determining compaction characteristics of soils in the laboratory. In this lecture, we will be discussing about continuing our discussion about factors affecting compaction and field assessment of compaction and some field compaction methods. So, this lecture title is soil compaction 2. As we discuss in the previous lecture, the for especially for fine, fine grain soils, compaction it depends upon the uh, you know uh, particularly the soil structure which actually changes from dry side of optimum to wet side of optimum. If you can see from this uh, slide here, this is for a light compaction and this is for modified compaction. So, for a uh, at point A the soil structure or fabric arrange or soil fabric is highly flocculated in nature and it possess it, it has high strength and higher permeability and less shrinkage and more swelling. And as we transverse from A to B, it actually un, the particles undergo rotation and then at point C, the soil is now uh, soil solids actually has been replaced by more water. So, hence the low strength and low permeability and more shrinkage and less swelling. So, this is uh, adopted whether to compact and dry side of optimum or wet side of optimum depending upon the type of application. Suppose, if you want uh, to compact the soil for a subgrade, then it is preferable to uh, compact it under the dry side of optimum, so that high load or high strength can be achieved. In case if we are uh, constructing a barrier to prevent ingress of any permeant, then it is advisable to compact on the wet side of optimum, so that the low permeabilities can be achieved. So, the scenario of uh, in case of uh, modified uh, compaction also, you have the similar uh, status. So, this is actually the direction of increasing dispersion is somewhere in this direction, this actually happens. So, uh, what we discussed in the previous slide is that at low water contents, attractive forces between clay particles predominate. So, creating more or less orientation of plate like particles are truss like uh, uh, orientations. So, at low water contents uh, the attractive forces are actually dominating because of that uh, more or less the orientation of platelet particle results in low density. And the addition of water increases the repulsion between the particles leading them to assume more parallel orientations. So, once uh, water is added the particles are actually deprived from coming closer and so hence the repulsion of the particles uh, takes place. If compacted wet of optimum parallel orientation is further increased leading to what is descri described as a dispersed structure. So, that is what actually we have seen. So, the soil structure uh, has uh, you know uh, uh, it has got a, a significant effect on the compaction. So, if you wanted to test or, uh, uh, or achieve this compaction in the field, then we need to have different uh, compaction equipments. In the field, basically fill soils are typically imported from a borrow uh, site and applied to the existing grade level in layers which are called as lifts. So, if you wanted to construct an embankment above the existing ground level, the soil is loose soil is placed at certain uh, water content and based on the uh, characteristics which are actually required, the soil is uh, compacted. So, these compacted layers are uh, called as lifts. When a lift of soil is placed, it will be very loose as I said and special compact, compaction equipment is then used to compact this lift, uh, lift of the soil. So, we have different types of soils and for this uh, different types of equipments are required. 
these are rollers uh, basically types of rollers where we have a smooth wheel rollers vibratory rollers pneumatic uh, tire rollers sheep's foot rollers and uh, very recently impact compactors rammers these are also types of uh, uh, for inducing dropping weight this is including piling equipment and in the internal combustion type ram rammer or pneumatic type rammer so these uh, smooth wheel uh, rollers basically they possesses 100% coverage area under the wheel load with ground contact pressures up to 380 kilo pascals so smooth wheel rollers have 100% coverage area and they have a ground contact pressures up to 380 kilo pascals so they will be able to induce a pressure of 380 kilo pascals on the surface of the ground so that that the soil can be compacted so in the conventional three wheel type uh, the weight will be around 18 tons tandem rollers will be about 1 to 14 tons three axle tandem rollers about 12 to 18 tons so weight can be increased by ballasting the rolls with uh, uh, water or by a heavy sliding weight or it can be ballasted with sand so performance is affected by the load per unit width under the compaction of rolls compaction rolls and the width and diameter of the rolls so load per unit width and diameter control the pressure in the surface layer of the soil and dimension of the rolls affect the rate with which the pressure decreases with the depth so these smooth wheel rollers are basically uh, suitable for uh, gravels sands hard core uh, uh, and hard co core type soil and crushed rock and any material where crushing action is needed so any material where crushing action is needed or crushed rock or hard core sands or gravels pneumatic tired rollers basically they have 80% coverage area so 80% of area is covered by tires uh, with the, with the tire with uh, tire pressures up to 700 kilo pascals so suitable basically for fine grained soils closely graded sands or silty sands and best performance on cohesive soils can be obtained when moisture content is maintained 2 to 4% below the plastic limit so the depth of compaction with the pneumatic tired roller can be light rollers uh, with 200 kN weight up to 150 mm medium rollers uh, with 50 50 tons or 500 kN up to 300 mm and heavy rollers with 1800 kN the depth of compaction can be uh, ensured up to 450 mm so these uh, rollers which are actually shown in this slide they are basically sheep foot rollers and we used basically for uh, uh, compacting fine grained soils the protrusions what we see here uh, they are very effective in inducing very high pressures to the soil so hence uh, the kneading of the soil takes place damping and kneading of the soil takes place when the roller uh, rolls on the soil so sheep foot rollers are most suitable for fine grained soils both plastic and non plastic especially at water contents uh, dry or optimum so area of protrusions range from 30 to 80 cm square and 8 to 8 to 12% coverage and very high contact pressures are possible ranging up to 1400 to 7000 kilo pascals so because of this uh, protrusions the area uh, the it can induce a pressure up to 1400 to 7000 kilo pascals as we have discussed in previous lectures in order to compact the fine grained soil a higher amount of static pressures are required to push the clay particles closer so the sheep foot rollers are used basically uh, the protrusions significance is that to induce high contact pressures now coming to vibrators which are basically used for uh, sandy or uh, gravelly soils there are two types of vibrators will be there out of balance type or pulsating hydraulic type the out of balance type vibrator will, will have two eccentric masses which are actually rotated in a opposite direction which induces vibration and we, uh, because of this a tamping above the centering height is created so this makes the particles to rearrange into the denser configuration so the vibrators uh, consists of a vibrating unit of either the out of balance weight type or a pulsating hydraulic type mounted on a plate or roller so the vibrators consists of a vibrating unit 
either the out of balance weight type what it was shown in the previous slide or a pulsating hydraulic type mounted on a plate or a roller. So, vibrators uh, give maximum ride density much in excess of corresponding compaction test value at OMC and frequencies of uh, these rollers uh, range from 1500 to uh, 2500 cycles per minute. Frequency range within the natural frequency of the most of the soil. So, the frequencies have to be in the range of the most of the natural frequency of the soils. The another uh, uh, type of compaction which is novel in nature is impact type compaction and it is the transfer of compactive energy into the soil by means of lifting and falling motion of a non circular rotating mass. So, in this case we have a non circular rotating mass this actually induces an impact type of compaction energy. So, it is the transfer of uh, compaction energy into the soil by means of lifting and falling motion of a non circular rotating mass. It has been uh, observed that this the depth of influence of uh, compaction can be larger in case of impact compaction. So, it is thus a process of capable of transferring impact load similar to those found in dynamic compaction uh, on a continuous basis. So, this is somewhat very close to the, the so called dynamic compaction. So, the impact compaction is uh, uh, the transfer of compactive energy into the soil by means of lifting and falling action of a non circular rotating uh, mass. So, as I said that the features include the energy rating of the different impact compaction equipments range from 10 kilo joules to 25 kilo joules. So, the energy rating uh, ranges from 10 kilo joules to 25 kilo joules and higher energy helps to achieve higher maximum ride density that allows to work over a wide range of moisture contents. So, here it is shown here in this slide uh, this is uh, with conventional compaction and this is with impact compaction. So, what it can be seen is that impact compaction induces uh, higher, uh, 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 higher uh, amount of compaction the densities achieved are high especially this is found to be very significant when uh, uh, you know when we compact it on the dry side of optimum. As uh, it has been mentioned the other feature is that increased depth of influence. The contra contact stress of impacted compactor is about uh, 300 kilo Pascals to 1200 kilo Pascals. This is exceeding the conventional rollers depending upon the soil stiffness. An impact rollers profile radio, uh, radius is not reference to the center of the drum greatly exceeding the conventional roller resulting in a greater contact area. So, the impact rollers profile radius is not reference to the center of the drum uh, which is exceeding which actually exceeds the conventional uh, rollers and results in a greater contact area. Net result in uh, is superior depth of influence enabling the compaction in layer thicknesses exceeding more than 1 meter. So, this is uh, exceeding 1 meter. So, net result is that uh, the superior depth of influence of uh, ensuring uh, uh, adequate compaction up to layer depths of 1 meter. So, this is uh, shown pictorially here. Here a conventional uh, uh, static uh, pressure uh, roller is shown here. So, the depth of influence if it is uh, uh, D 1 and with a vibratory roller if the depth of influence is D 2. So, D 2 is greater than D 1. But when you have impact energy with a impactor which is actually have non circular uh, compactor and because of this uh, the dropping height which is actually uh, you know here for this H 3 will be greater than H 2 greater than H 1. So, this means that this induces very high energy and uh, it, uh, because of this it ensures uh, depth of influence uh, significantly high. So, impact energy of high amplitude with low frequency and uh, because of this reason the impact uh, imp um, uh, this impact compaction ensures higher uh, depth of influences. Another feature is that increase in load duration the impact compactors load duration has been measured to be approximately 10 to 15 times longer than that of conventional rollers. So, this is good for some uh, fine grained soils to arrange into the denser configuration. So, this because of this uh, it enhances the soil to arrange into the denser configuration. So, here it is shown here increased load duration for a conventional uh, compaction if it is 0.02 seconds for a impact compaction it is about uh, 0.12 seconds. So, longer duration results in uh, 
reduced soil response and greater compaction. So, this is uh, one of the other uh, uh, you know merits of uh, impact uh, compaction. And uh, another uh, this, uh, uh, feature is that high operating speeds, impact compactors operate at speeds up to 5 times faster and 10 times greater volume per day than the conventional uh, compaction equipment. So, in the summary here, uh, smooth wheel rollers what we have seen here, they are actually used basically for sands and gravels and pneumatic rubber tiled rollers, uh, silts and clays, ship's foot rollers basically for silts and clays and fine grained soils and vibratory rollers especially uh, used for uh, sandy and uh, gravel soils and uh, vibratory tampers also used for sands and gravels. This basically to increase the compaction energy applied to the soil in the field, increase the mass or weight of the compaction equipment or decrease the lift thickness. That means, that if you are able to decrease the lift thickness, there is a possibility that good adequate compaction can be ensured in the field and increase the number of machinery passes. So, these uh, we also have discussed that the increasing the number of machinery passes also uh, sometimes uh, will be wasted because uh, further increase with uh, you know increase in number of passes does not completely ensure uh, compaction energy. There should be an optimum number of passes. So, in the field compaction as we are actually uh, trying to assimilate in general granular soils can be compacted in thicker layers than silt and clay. So, granular layers can be uh, compacted in thicker layers than silt and clay. Silt and clay or if you have got a fine grained soils or nowadays uh, materials like uh, coal ash, they are required to be compacted in thin layers. And granular layers are usually compacted using kneading, tamping or vibratory compaction techniques and cohesive soils usually need, uh, need kneading, tamping and impact type of compaction. So, this uh, cohesive soils require kneading and uh, tamping or, or impact type of compaction. So, as per our previous uh, uh, discussion in the lectures, we have actually classified the soils and soils such as GW, GP that is well graded gravels and poorly graded gravels and well graded uh, silty gravel and uh, gravelly clay and uh, sand with well graded uh, sand and uh, poorly graded sand and silty sand have good compaction characteristics. So, if you look into this, soils such as uh, GW, GP and uh, GM, as GC, SW, SP and SM have good compaction characteristics and other soils such as SC, CL and ML, uh, uh, they are the characterized as the good to poor characteristics as far as the compaction point of view. At any rate, the quality of the field compaction needs to be assured by measuring the in situ dry unit weight of the compacted soil at random locations. So, whenever we are actually doing a compaction uh, uh, of a particular soil, the density has to be ensured because uh, the inadequate compaction of a soil uh, can lead to the uh, distress in the structure once it is released for uh, usage. So, the field compaction and specifications uh, uh, when, it, uh, when it comes, we actually have two categories of uh, earthwork specifications. One is that end, end product specification and method specifications. So, we will uh, discuss as far as the end product specifications uh, in, in which a certain relative compaction or a percent compaction is specified. So, here uh, if you are actually having a coarse grained soil then we actually uh, ensure the relative density of uh, a particular soil. Uh, so, if, if you wanted to have a adequate compaction, we will say that 70 percent relative density or 80 percent relative density has to be achieved or when we are actually having say especially for fine grained soils, the relative compaction is used. So, relative compaction is nothing but a ratio of the unit weight of the soil which is actually in the field and uh, unit, weight of, uh, unit weight of the soil, dry unit weight of soil which is actually obtained maximum dry unit weight of the soil in the laboratory. This maximum dry unit weight of the soil can be obtained either from the uh, modified proctor compaction or from the light compaction test. This is de depending upon the, the type of the specifications. This RC cannot be one because 100 percent uh, compaction cannot be achieved. 
So, this generally the relative compaction is defined as the ratio of the field dry unit weight to the laboratory maximum dry unit weight according to some specified standard test for example, standard proctor or modified proctor test and this is basically expressed in percentage. So, if you, uh, difference between relative compaction and relative density if you look into it, the relative density is basically applied to granular soils and if some fines are present, uh, it is difficult to decide. Um, whether to adopt for relative compaction or relative uh, density. Uh, according to ASTM D2049, the if the, the relative density is required to be performed, uh, if the fines that is passing 75 micron C u less than 12, 12, 12 percent. If there are actually more than 12 percent fines, then uh, the relative compaction need to be adopted. So, otherwise the compaction test should be used. So, here what uh, the relative density is uh, basically defined as uh, which, which is interrelation between uh, maximum void ratio, minimum void ratio and in situ, in situ void ratio. Uh, here uh, which is uh, wrongly written here, the relative density is nothing but E max minus E divided by E max by E minimum into 100. So, engineering properties of cohesion soils, cohesionless soils are primarily a function of relative density dr. So, in this uh, particular slide, uh, a relationship between relative density and uh, relative compaction is shown here. Um, as can be seen here, uh, with the uh, void ratio infinity gamma d is equal to 0 for uh, in case of say granular soils and then E max which is at gamma d minimum. E minimum at gamma d max, in situ void ratio at E is equal to ga, uh, at gamma d. So, the relative density is uh, it ranges from 0 to 100. For a given project where uh, the specifications uh, say about 70 percent, that means that at this point the in situ void ratio of certain void ratio has to be achieved. In case of relative compaction, it appears like it is uh, ranges from this place to this place, uh, this uh, point to this point. So, this is uh, somewhere if you are specifying say 90 percent compaction. So, somewhere it actually it can result here. So, so in the field often the questions have to be answered are to what dry unit weight must the soil be compacted. So, what should be the dry unit weight the soil should be compacted and how can this be achieved efficiently. And, uh, and how this can be verified whether it has been achieved or not. So, we have actually field density tests uh, which are actually destructive as well as non-destructive tests. So, for many construction applications involving roadway subgrades and trench backfills, there are typical standards specifying the minimum relative compaction uh, that must be achieved. So, for many construction applications involving roadway subgrades and uh, trench backfills, there are typical standards specifying the minimum relative compaction that must be achieved. So, in this particular slide, uh, a typical uh, compaction uh, of a soil for different projects, it is shown here. Fields to support buildings or roadways, uh, minimum which is required to be ensured is 90 percent. That means that 90 percent of uh, laboratory compaction density should be achieved. Top 150 m of subgrade below roadways should have 90 percent of 95 percent of compaction and aggregate base material below roadways has to achieve 95 percent and in earthen dams 100 percent has to be ensured. So, that uh, there will not be any seepage and uh, distress due to settlements and all. So, the relative compaction uh, different types of uh, relative compact threshold limit which are required to be ensured is actually given in this slide. So, here if you look into the, this particular slide, a slide which is actually shown here the dry unit weight versus water content indicating the most efficient conditions for field compactions. So, the range here if you look into this here, uh, this is the dry side of optimum that is dry, dry to optimum and this is wet side of optimum and these are the uh, 0 air voids line and uh, these are uh, void, uh, saturation lines which are actually having less than 100 percent saturation. Uh, 90, 80, 70 like that. And uh, if you look into this here at point A and point B, there is uh, this water content is dry side of optimum and this water content is say uh, wet side of optimum. So, uh, gamma field 
uh, which is nothing but 95 percent of uh, gamma dry max that that comes out here. That means that we have got uh, two ranges of water content. One is actually having uh, uh, dry side of optimum, other is on the wet side of optimum with same uh, you know density. So, the range AC indicated the range of which the soil should be compacted uh, to achieve relative compaction at any energy level. So, here to achieve 95 percent uh, relative compaction, the placement water content of compacted fill must be greater than water content A and uh, less than C. That means that in order to achieve 95 percent compaction, the placement water content of a given soil uh, must be greater than water content A. That means that whatever is dry state of optimum, let us say OMC minus 2 and less than OMC plus 2. Let us say that if that point happens to be C and uh, that is OMC plus 2, it should be less than that. So, if you say that 95 percent uh, compaction, uh, 95 percent reduce compaction, the placement water content of compacted fill must be uh, between these two ranges. And these points are found where the 95 percent reduce compaction line intersects the uh, compaction curve. And if the placement water content is outside the range of A to C, then it will be difficult and it, if not possible to achieve the required uh, percentage of the real to compaction. That is the reason why it may be necessary to at times to wet or dry the soil prior to the lowing. So, if the water contents are, if they are not within the this range, it may require wetting or drying of the soil. So, that to ensure this so called 95 percent of the compaction. So, when further when we discuss about the field compaction and specifications, so having established the range of the placement water content, if required to ask what is the best placement water content to use. So, most efficient water content uh, should be that OMC, uh, where uh, the contractor provides the maximum compact effort to attain the required uh, 95 percent real to compaction. The most efficient placement water contents exist between OMC lab and OMC field. So, it must be also noted that the most efficient water content exists between OMC laboratory and OMC field. The range of placement water content should also be specified along with RC. So, uh, the compaction when we are actually doing when the borrow material has been identified, when it has been characterized in the laboratory. So, the range of the placement water content should also be specified along with the relative compaction that ensures that uh, the proper uh, compaction in the site. So, in the method specifications what we have actually uh, uh, indicated earlier, the second category, second category, the type and weight of roller and number of passes of that roller as well as the lift thicknesses are specified. So, this uh, specification requires prior knowledge of the borrow soils, so as to be able to predict in advance how many passes of or for example, a certain type of roller will produce adequate compaction performance. So, this requires uh, test fields before carrying out actual uh, compaction. So, method specifications is only justified very large compaction projects such as earthen dams. So, having discussed about the type of equipment for ensuring uh, field compaction and uh, some specifications uh, to ensure proper compaction, we need to discuss about uh, field density testing methods. First of all, the question will come is that how many number of tests have to be carried out. Say for large fields, about one sampling uh, per 1000 to 2000 uh, square meter area per lift, per lift means per layer, compacted layer. And for small fields, which are actually having less than 1000 meter square, 2 to 3 samples per lift. And for a fill with lateral dimensions 100 by 100 meters, one would expect to take 5 to 10 samples measurements per lift. So, if you are having a fill by 100 meter by 100 meter size, one would expect to take uh, 5 to 10 samples uh, per lift. So, typical specifications call for a new uh, field test every 1000 to 3000 cubic meter or so when the borrow material changes uh, significantly. Suppose, if the borrow material changes, the test location should be located there. Otherwise, a thumb rule is that 1000 to 3000 cubic meter of soil, a new field test has to be carried out. So, the field density tests are basically two types. One is destructive test, other one is non-destructive test. Destructive method involves excavation and removal of some of the fill material, whereas non-destructive tests determine density and water content of the fill indirectly without uh, uh, destroying the compacted layer. 
destructive methods are basically uh, divided into two, two uh, methods one is sand replacement method and core cutter method other one is rubber balloon method where if you have got uh, uh, improper soil profile then the rubber balloon method uh, can be used particularly if you are uh, assessing unit weight of municipal solid waste deposit the rubber balloon methods are very very useful. Non destructive methods include uh, the nuclear density methods uh, which we will be discussing in uh, further slides. Destructive methods are time consuming and uh, each and every uh, location the layer has to be disturbed and uh, the and uh, also uh, it requires uh, determination of water content. So, that the dry density or dry unit weight can be determined. Nuclear density method has high purchase cost and the safety precautions during the nuclear, nuclear density uh, test, test method have to be followed. The safety precautions during nuclear density tests have to be followed. The sand replacement method or sand cone method which is nothing but a sand with known density is filled in the uh, sand uh, cone jar and weight of the sand cone apparatus uh, along with the sand which is recorded. So, here uh, for a certain type of standard sand you need to be used and if that weight of sand cone apparatus with sand uh, is uh, say W 1 and weight of the sand to fill the cone is to be determined is W 2. Uh, so, that is uh, for the weight of the sand to fill the cone is, uh, is said W 2 and if the sand hole in the compacted soil is excavated and weighed uh, the, if suppose if the small hole in the compacted soil is say excavated and weighed. So, if you wanted to determine in a particular layer, so what you will do is that we will excavate a small hole and uh, weigh the soil and that weight is say W 3 the apparatus is inverted over the hole and valve is open. So, we will release the sand into the uh, portion where the soil has been removed compacted soil has been removed. So, weight of the apparatus with the remaining sand is determined and that is W 4. So, once we uh, if you can get weight of the sand to fill the hole if you are able to get that can be obtained by W 1 minus W 2 plus W 4 within brackets and uh, the volume of the hole can be obtained as weight of the sand divided by gamma d sand. So, weight of the dry soil can be obtained by W 3 which what we have actually obtained by removing the particular, uh, particular soil from the, uh, from the uh, portion what uh, it is shown here and divided by 1 plus W uh, we will get the dry weight of the soil and the dry unit weight can be obtained as W d divided by volume V. See volume V is nothing but volume of the hole is nothing but the dry sand uh, the unit weight will be knowing and W s that is the weight of the sand. So, once I know this uh, that is weight of the sand to fill the hole divided by this I will get the volume of the hole. So, with that the dry unit weight W d by V can be determined. So, in majority of the cases uh, we have situations where uh, the relative compaction of the fill containing over size particles comes into the picture. So, sometimes this needs to be uh, you know corrected otherwise the field densities measured may can be misleading. So, over size particles will be defined here as the rock uh, that is retained on 19 mm sieve the soil matrix is the material passing 19 mm sieve. So, if you are having a, a fraction which is actually say passing uh, uh, retained in 19 mm sieve and that is actually called as fraction of the oversized particles. So, there are three methods we will be discussing one method that is the elimination method. So, these three methods are elimination method adjustable maximum dry unit weight method this is according to DM 7.2 and this is suitable when the weight of the oversized particles is less than 60 percent by weight and substitution method. Out of these two with an increase in uh, this oversized particle fraction the elimination method the, the total density is predicted by elimination method will be on the higher side both adjustable maximum dry unit weight method and substitution method they are uh, close enough to uh, you know account for the uh, corrections which are actually possible because of the presence of the over size particles. So, this elimination uh, method involves that perform the field density test and determine the total volume and total weight of the soil. 
sieving on 19 mm sieve separates the ore size particles from the soil matrix with that we will know that weight of the that is the gravel fraction. So, knowing the weight and the specific gravity of the ore size particles the volume of the ore size material can be calculated. So, assuming that uh, a fill uh, that must be uh, compacted to 90 percent due compaction. So, use of the elimination method would require the highest field density values. So, this, imp this implies that uh, assuming a field that must be compacted to 90 percent relative compaction the use of elimination method would require the highest uh, field density field lower dry density values. So, here in this slide according to day 1989 the three methods which have been uh, cited here have been discussed by day 89 uh, day 1989 the relationship between the total dry unit weight of the fill to the fraction of the water size particles is given here gamma total is the total uh, uh, weight of the soil uh, matrix and gamma d max is the maximum dry unit weight of the uh, soil uh, soil in the laboratory r c is the relative compaction gamma w is the unit weight of water and gamma w is uh, unit weight of water again g naught is nothing but the specific gravity of the water size particles and f is nothing but the gravel fraction and gamma d max is again the uh, the uh, laboratory uh, compa dry compaction value maximum dry unit weight of the uh, soil. So, the gamma total is given by gamma d max r c gamma w uh, gamma w g naught into 1 minus f plus f into gamma d max into r c. So, if you substitute uh, uh, for a given type of soil with uh, certain uh, characteristics of uh, uh, ore size particles it will show that as the fraction of ore size particles increases gamma total increases this is because the more ore size particles in a fill the then the higher gamma total must be of the, must be in order to keep the soil matrix at a desired relative compaction. So, by using this uh, uh, particular expression and the discussion it is possible to account for the presence of ore size particles uh, in the soil matrix and this needs to be considered if you are having a particles which are actually more than uh, 19 mm are retained in the 19 mm in the while testing uh, field density method by using uh, uh, by, by using sand density method, that is uh, sand cone method. The next uh, method which we have said is the nuclear density method. This uses a low level radio radioactive waste source that is inserted via probe into the central uh, center of a newly compacted soil layer. So, this is one type of method in which uh, a small trench is made and uh, a low level radioactive waste source is uh, inserted, but there are also some sources where the, the, the nuclear density measuring uh, apparatus will be on the surface of the soil uh, in touch with the soil and then it also will measure. The, so, the source basically emits rays through the compacted soil that are captured by a sensor at the bottom surface of the nuclear density device. So, the intensity of the captured radioactivity is inversely proportional to the soil density. The intensity of the captured uh, radioactivity uh, uh, is uh, inversely proportional to soil density. So, this apparatus is calibrated using sand cone replacement method, sand cone or sand replacement method for various soils and it is usually provides reliable estimates of for moisture content and dry weight. So, this needs to be calibrated by using uh, you know conventional method. Once this is calibrated then this uh, particular uh, uh, method can be used very rapidly to get the densities and water contents achieved after the compaction. So, this method provides fast results allowing the user to perform a large number of tests in a short time and it also enables uh, uh, to release the layer for a next layer next lift compaction uh, immediately. See the nuclear moisture density methods the principal elements include nuclear source emitting the gamma rays and detecting to pick gamma rays passing through see there is a detector which uh, picks the gamma rays passing through the soil and counter to determine the rate of gamma rays uh, reaches the detector. So, the, it, it actually has got two three uh, three fundamental elements once one is that emitting uh, gamma rays other one is a detector other one is the counter. So, common nuclear sources are radium beryllium combination and cesium uh, americium and beryllium combination. So, these are the common uh, nuclear sources which are actually used in nuclear moisture density methods. 
So, density determination the principle involved is like this gamma rays penetrate into the soil and some are absorbed and some reach the detector. Amount of radiation reached is detect uh, reaching detector is inversely proportional to the soil and uh, basically soil density and uh, nuclear count rate received at the detector compared with the calibration curves provided by the manufacturer. So, nuclear count rate received at the detector uh, should have to be compared with the calibration curves provided by the manufacturer. Similarly, for the moisture determination, moisture content is obtained from the uh, thermal uh, neutron count. Alpha particles are basically emitted by the source americium or radium source uh, which bombard a beryllium target emitting fast neutrons. The fast neutrons lose velocity if they strike hydrogen atoms in water molecules. So, resulting low velocity neutrons are called as thermal neutrons. So, based on this uh, uh, the estimation of water content is done through in the nuclear density methods. So, moisture results are provided as a weight of water per unit volume of soil tested and dry weight is obtained from the uh, subtracting the moisture determination from the wet density determination. So, significant error occurs if soil contains iron, boron or cadmium. So, there is a possibility that uh, a, one of the limitations is that a significant error can occur if the soil being compacted or compacted contains iron, boron or cadmium uh, elements. The first method is actually shown here provides more accurate results and radiation sources are placed into the test material by using punched or drilled hole and depth between 50 mm to 300 mm can be tested and information surrounding the source is obtained. So, this is shown picturally here uh, this is the trench which is actually uh, placed and it actually emits the gamma rays and then is a gamma photon detectors are here and this is the nuclear gauge which is actually in touch with the soil. In case of second method, backscatter method it is called, radioactive source and detector located on the surface of the soil itself. This is actually widely used in majority of the equipments available and gamma rays directed into the soil and some of the uh, some reflect back uh, to the detector and accuracy suffers if there is a gap exists between the soil surface and the nuclear density device. So, information about the soil uh, nearest to the surface is actually obtained. So, in this method, uh, in the back scatter method where you have got the detector and uh, uh, this uh, source uh, they are actually at the same place and it has to be in touch with the soil and it is possible that information uh, uh, from the surface of the soil can be obtained very effectively. The third method is the air gap method which is basically a less common method and is uh, used when the composition of the near surface materials adversely affects the density measures then a stand is provided and uh, the density is measured on the surface. So, this as I said that uh, the soil is compacted in uh, different lifts and if the lift thicknesses are too large then the following can occur. Soil at the top of the field will be well compacted and soil at the bottom of the lift will not be compacted at all. So, if I have a lift thickness of say uh, more than uh, half a meter, uh, then uh, soil at the top of the lift uh, appear to be compacted and that can give the misleading results and then uh, overall uh, what will happen is that uh, when we have got the number of layers which are compacted like that, this can uh, lead to the distress uh, and leading to the performance and serviceability of the structure which is being uh, used for a particular application. So, soil at the top of the lift will be well compacted and soil at the bottom of the lift will not be compacted at all. So, here in this slide uh, a particular lift layer thickness if it is there you can see that the soil at the middle portion is compacted very well at the interface point there is a possibility that uh, uh, the compaction is not achieved at all. So, the it has to be ensured that the lift thickness should be such that the minimum compaction is actually met at all points. So, that uh, if the if this is the uh, if this is uh, you know the 95 percent compaction which is actually required then this particular zone is actually shows that the lift thickness is such that this is actually uh, has in inadequate compaction but if you have a lift thickness such that there are the 95 percent compaction is achieved then this is actually preferred here this is with adequate compaction and this is with inadequate compaction and here uh, in this particular slide uh, field dry density versus number of passes is shown. So, the dry density versus number of passes and if you have got a wetter soil uh, the number of passes will not actually help because 
as I said here the pore water pressure which actually increases and will not allow the soil to compact. And similarly, uh, with the natural uh, soil with uh, increasing some uh, in case of dry soils the increasing number of passes can be uh, somewhat appear to be effective here may not be initially, but with the uh, higher number of layers uh, for the drier soils there can be higher densities can be achieved. So, here at one moisture content uh, with the different thicknesses it can be shown here. So, the dry density achieved with the number of passes you can see that with the increased number of increased uh, layer thickness the density achieved for a given number of passes is less. Uh, but increasing number of passes with uh, more number of passes with uh, is not having particular uh, influence. And uh, mostly for compaction equip equipment the lift thickness should be typically be order of 150 mm or uh, 300 mm. So, in that case what will happen is that the wheel of the compaction element like uh, a pressure bulb uh, which, which actually has got high stress re region as well as the low stress region. So, uh, if this uh, is ensured this possibility that uh, the compaction can be uh, effectively can be ensured in the field. So, the approx method for determining the lift height in the field is according to Apollonia, D Apollonia 1969 is that first uh, for a given for a large lift height uh, you with a particular uh, number of passes determine the you know relative density with depth. So, if you have uh, uh, if, if it is achieved for a, a largest uh, lift height say D max. So, the density depth relationship for the large lift height using uh, uh, 5 roller passes if the if depth used to be D max the D should be small enough so that the loose layer is not trapped near the uh, interface between the lefts. So, this particular D should be small enough so that the loose layer is not trapped between the two compacted layers. So, this is one layer one layer lift compaction this is another layer lift compaction and we have to ensure that as it was shown in the previous slide that this particular point is actually well above the, uh, uh, the desired relative density or desired degree of relative compaction. So, in this uh, particular problem uh, particular slide we will see a problem on the compaction. Uh, the given data is that water content versus dry unit weight and we need to plot the compaction curve and the water content data and the unit weights are given and uh, we need to plot 80 percent and dry percent 100 percent saturation lines that is part A. Part B is that if it is proposed to secure a relative compaction of 95 percent in the soil what is the range of water content that can be allowed and would the 20 percent air void curve be same as the 80 percent saturation curve. So, we have discussed in the previous lecture that uh, they are not same but let us see how that can be illustrated uh, with the help of this problem. So, based on the given data uh, if uh, the graph is actually plotted uh, with the dry unit weight on the y axis in kilo Newton per meter cube and water content on the x axis then this is the compaction curve. By using this gamma d is equal to g s gamma w plus 1 w g 1 plus w g s r by s r we can actually determine the 100 percent uh, saturation line 100 percent saturation line. So, the gamma d max is equal to 17.45 that is this uh, density this dry unit weight and water content optimum moisture content of 15.17 percent. So, this particular data for a given soil which uh, has got the maximum dry unit weight of 17.45 uh, kilo Newton per meter cube and optimum moisture content of 15.17 percent and this is 100 percent saturation line and this is 80 percent saturation line. Now, in continuation of uh, to determine the relative compaction with the 95 percent relative compaction is specified. So, gamma d field which is actually required is that 0 0.95 into 17.45 is 16.58 kilo per meter cube. So, range of water content that can be allowed in the field is 10 to 17 percent that is uh, from this slide uh, for uh, that particular density 90, 95 percent of this the range of water contents allow, can be allowed in the field is ranges from here to here. That is uh, now the discussion about uh, 20 percent air voids curve and 80 percent uh, saturation line 
whether they are same or not. So, we knew that 20 percent air voids line means we can actually compute gamma d is equal to G s gamma w into 1 minus N a. N a is nothing but the percentage air voids plus 1 plus w G s. And this yields uh, for a N a is equal to 0.2 that is 20 percent air voids and at water content of 8.5 percent the gamma d as 17.22 kilo Newton per meter cube which is actually found to be different if you try to compute for 80 percent degree saturation gamma d is equal to g s w g s into gamma w plus 1 plus w g s by s r when s r is equal to 0 0.8 and water content is equal to uh, point uh, that is 8.5 percent the density which is actually obtained is around 20.56. So, this density is actually different from what is actually obtained from this one. So, if they are have to be same then uh, we need to actually get the same values. Hence, uh, we can say that the 20 percent air voids lane which is actually air voids curve is not the same as the uh, 80 percent uh, saturation lines. Similarly, air content lines also. So, uh, these all methods what we discussed is about the shallow compaction methods, but there are situations where uh, we have got uh, requirement to compact the soil at uh, deeper depths. And for that there are a number of techniques which are actually available. Traditionally the terra probe method which was available and now currently the one which is actually being used is vibro flotation and uh, building sand compaction piles, blasting and dynamic compaction. And these are actually covered in detail in ground improvement subject, uh, but in place densification of uh, granular soils is very much required nowadays if you are building a structures which are resting on uh, saturated uh, sandy or silty sandy soils uh, and this to as a remedial measure for uh, preventing liquefaction susceptibility in the future. So, they, they have been successfully used for compaction in situ soils especially granular soils. So, in this slide uh, the terra probe method which is actually shown here and works best for shallow water tables and uh, it actually has got activated vibro driver causes the probe to vibrate in the vertical direction. The probe actually vibrates in vertical direction and to achieve soil compaction the probe is actually vibrated to the plant depth of the penetration. Uh, so, the spacings generally uh, 1.5 meter which is actually placed and the, the area is actually compacted. So, here a this particular photograph shows uh, the process of compaction by using the terra probe method. In the in place densification of granular soils uh, that is for vibro flotation, when conventional rolling type compaction equipment works the surface of the area uh, the improvement in the density is limited to the only uh, 1 or 2 meters. But if you have a requirement of compaction at the deeper depths then these uh, uh, in situ densification which is actually required to be adopted up to certain depths means then vibro flotation is a viable option. So, vibro flotation equipment operates uh, from a site from sites uh, at ground surface, but it can densify the full depth of the granular deposit which are deep as about 12, 14, 15 meters. So, up to 15 uh, meters the vibro flotation equipment uh, generally it can be used for uh, densifying the soil even at deeper depths now it is being tried. And uh, the ranges of the soils or particle size distributions which are actually uh, possible. Uh, for uh, uh, adoption is uh, here the particularly the range of the particle size distribution suitable for the densification by vibro flotation which actually shows that the, the soil should be uh, gravel or sandy uh, if they are in the loose state then it is possible that they can be compacted. But you can see here when it comes to clay the usage of this method is actually limited then we have to adopt uh, appropriate methods. The vibro flotation method involves using a device called vibro floto, vibro float, which is a cylindrical piece of equipment about 2 meters long, 4 and a mm in diameter and weighing about 17.8 kilo newtons. So, what it does is the vibro float, this exerts vibrations in vertical as well as the lateral directions. This makes the soil particles to arrange into the denser configuration. The eccentric weight inside the cylinder develops a, a centrifugal force of about 89 kilo Newton at 1800 rpm. The device has water jets at top and bottom. So, these water jets actually will allow to the probe to penetrate at a, um, this uh, uh, with at a rapid rate 
and the flow rate is about 0 0.23 to 0 0.3 meter cube per minute at a pressure of about 415 to 550 kilonewton per meter square. That means about 4 to 5 bar pressure the device can actually operate and jet the water. So, with that what will happen is that the penetration of the probe takes place very easily and the vibrofloat sinks into the ground at the rate of 1 to 2 meter per minute. When the desired depth is reached the top jet is turned off and the device is done withdrawn uh, at the rate of receding rate is about 0.3 meter per minute. So, uh, the sinking rate is about 1 meter to 2 meter per minute and the withdrawal rate is about 0.3 meter per minute and the sand is actually added from the top and if you are actually adding other materials then it is called as vibro replacement. So, in a regular working day a compaction of 2550 to 5100 meter cube is not uncommon by using this method. So, the process is actually shown here pictorially uh, the jetting of the water and then uh, the compaction and then withdrawal here. So, here the in this process what will happen is that the deeper soils can be compacted and when you do it at certain uh, grid of spacings covering the large area then entire soil uh, needs uh, gets uh, uh, densified. So, here at the at start lower jet is uh, opened fully and here at the uh, uh, portion uh, this in this slide 2 water is introduced more rapidly than it can drain away. So, this creates a momentarily the so called uh, quick condition ahead of the equipment which actually permits the vibrating machine to settle its own weight. So, the weight itself is actually sufficient to uh, settle the, uh, the probe uh, up to the uh, desired depth. Once uh, in the third step the water from the lower jet is actually transferred to the top jets and the, uh, uh, and the pressure and the volume are reduced just enough to carry the sand to the bottom of the hole. So, with that what will happen is that the and again the sand which is actually uh, introduced there is uh, compacted by using the vibro float which is actually available at the surface. So, this process actually makes a, a replacement of the loose soil with a densified uh, column or a densified uh, column actually having a densified sand. So, actual compaction takes place uh, during intervals between 0.3 meter lifts which are actually made in return with the vibro float to the surface. So, this is how the process of the vibro flotation is actually done. Uh, there are other technique which is uh, called as the blasting. So, this generally is adopted when you are actually having a top layer uh, also a loose soil. Suppose, if you are having a uh, this, this uh, blasting is nothing but uh, the uh, arranging a creating a soil uh, the soil densification by supplying a uh, explosive energy. The range of soil grain size is suitable for compacting by blasting method or same as the vibro flotation. In this method the compaction is achieved by successful detonations of small explosive charges in saturated soils. Relative densities up to 70 to 80 percent up to depth of the 20 to 25 meters can be achieved. But one uh, important caution is that if you are having a dense sand layer on the top and loose sand layer at the base then in such situations this particular technique need to be avoided because the, the it can lead to the loosening of the top sand layer uh, in the process of compacting the loose sand layer beneath the dense sand layer. So, so these are the uh, in the explosive charges are basically 60 percent of dynamite, 30 percent special gelatin and ammonia are most commonly used and they are placed generally about the two third times the thickness of the stratum and the spacings generally vary from 3 to 8 meters. And there are 5 to successive detonations are placed so that the soil can be arranged into the dense configuration. So, the shock wakes actually create uh, a sort of liquefaction and make the soil uh, compacted into denser configuration. So, this is uh, a particular relationship uh, which, which gives weight of charge uh, to a, a sphere of influence of that energy W is equal to C R cube and R is nothing but the sphere of influence and C is nothing but the material constant that is 0 0.0025 for 60 percent dynamite. So, the last method what we have actually said is the dynamic compaction which is nothing but uh, the dropping of a, a known weight from a known height which actually creates uh, a sort of uh, primary waves and secondary waves and these uh, this is actually when it is uh, done in a soil it creates uh, the so called uh, uh, rearrangement of the soil particles and makes the soil particles displaces to the denser configuration. 
So this method consisting of dropping of a weight from a relatively greater height. So the weights ranging from 2 tons to 15 tons and drops having ranged from 10 to 13 meters have to be adopted. So usually the closed spacing grid, uh, pattern of like 6 meter by 6 meter is called as a print spacing need to be adopted and each uh, we have primary pass or secondary pass or tertiary pass. This can densify loose dense cohesionless soils and fracture and densify buried building rubble and nowadays uh, uh, old building sites or uh, construction debris or some waste landfills are also being compacted by using this uh, method. So, in this lecture what we have actually introduced is that field compaction testing methods, their assessment of the field compaction of the field and then we also discussed about uh, uh, how we can actually correct in case if you are having a over size particles and then in addition to the shallow compaction methods what we discuss, we also have discussed about an introduction we have given to uh, different methods which are actually existing for densifying the soils at greater depths. This is required for, uh, for, uh, for strengthening the soils against uh, uh, liquefaction susceptibility.